Welcome to the Run It Once podcast, A Hero's Journey. And today my guest is Andrew Lucky Chewy Lichtenberger. How's it going, Andrew? It is wonderful. Thanks for having me, Lynn. Yeah, I haven't spoke to you uh, for a long time. You're looking really sharp, I've got to say. Right, I'm going to ask you a random question to start off with, okay? All right. And that will lead us somewhere on your journey and uh, we'll navigate ourselves uh, through it from there. So you've got, you've got different uh, categories you can choose from. Okay. Okay. So you choose a category of either money, family, relationships, career, or sex. So am I just choosing one and all the yeah, just questions choose, are in that category? Choose yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um let's do career. Let's do career. Okay. So you can fold. I'm going to ask you, you you get three questions, you can fold twice. Okay. Then you've got to answer the third one, okay? (laughs) All right, let's have a look here, Andrew. Which of your friends do you envy the most? Envy is a pretty strong word. I mean, I definitely look up to a lot of my friends. I wouldn't say I really envy any of them, though, because I think I'm able to draw inspiration from a lot of their successes. Um. I don't know, maybe it's just my interpretation of the word envy, but it feels like it has a negative connotation. Okay, let's have a conversation about that then, because um, this is actually a question that I ask high-stakes poker players a lot when I'm working on the Triton Poker Tour. Mm-hmm. And I would say, unanimously, the response is the same. The responses are not envious of anyone, because envy almost uh, intimates jealousy. And, yeah. and, I know, and I know when I've listened to a lot of podcasts with a lot of great thinkers that there's a, there's a, there is this view that envy is like a bad thing, right? But I, I kind of like to take that envy is a good thing. So when I think to myself about who I'm envious of, um, it, it, I then ask myself, well, why am I envious of them? And then I can break it down to the, compo- the components of why that envy exists. So whether it's something to do with their career, whether it's something to do with their relationships, whether it's something to do with their financial status or how they look. And then that tells me something about where my goals and pursuits lie and where I'm kind of lacking. So, so I look at it as a kind of, a, um, oh, I'm envious of Andrew Lichtenberger because he actually gets to do every, anything that he wants to do, he gets to do it because there's absolute utter freedom. And I'm envious of that which tells me that it's a really important value to me. And a lot of people don't understand what their important values are. So with that, what, what do you think about that? I guess I would ask if the question was framed as, who are you most inspired by? Would you treat it any differently or you treat it the same? It would have to have like an add-on, add-on element to it. So if you said to me, who am I inspired by? I would say I'm inspired by David Beckham. And then the conversation would then lead to like, well, what inspires you about him? So, so that would then take me down a different route because I would be saying, well, his work ethic inspires me. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I would touch on the envious parts, which is I'm envious of his success. I'm envious of his ability, his skill level. I'm envious of his business acumen. I'm envious of um, uh, the, the level of success he got with my boyhood club. So, so that the two end up with different kind of like, um, forms yeah. of interrogation, I guess. So I, I can see where you're going with that. Mm. I guess the way I look at it is, um, no matter what person you look at in life, someone's better than you at something. And sometimes those are things that you're striving for that might, uh, you know, cause you to have those feelings of envy or perhaps inspiration. And other times are things that you don't really care about, but I don't know. I mean, I've been fortunate in poker to have a lot of success and to kind of, um, be able to understand what feelings come with that success. So, mm, I don't know. I guess I'm, I guess I'm dancing around the question a bit, but uh, I mean, I can just name poker players that I, I look up to. Like, yeah, who do, who inspire? Well, it doesn't even have to be poker. Like, who inspires you in life? Okay. Um, well, I, I think uh, people who are innovative and like um, thought leader maybe isn't the right way to say it, but um, people that are innovative with, with thought and idea and, um, uh, just create new things. Um, creativity kind of has been a theme of my life over the recent past where say earlier in my poker career, I was 
more just focused on the grind specifically. Um, but I've really come to value creativity and, um, you know, even uh, of times past, uh, people like Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, like the composers, I just uh, having recently gotten into music, find that to just be unbelievable uh, in terms of, you know, having that skill set to be able to put so many different components together and create masterpieces like that. Um, so I guess things along those lines, which you do see in poker, you know, as the strategies evolved and um, the implementation of different strategies, you definitely see people like um, the Stephen Chidwicks of the world, you know, being very innovative in the way that uh, they're able to take these new ideas and practically apply them. You said something there that's quite interesting. You, you said that uh, you, you talked a little bit about creativity being more in the present or the, or the near present. Um, and you mentioned about in the past being more uh, uh, interested in the grind. Um, mm-hmm. And then, then you touch upon these great composers in the world like Mozart, etc. cetera. And I, and I think in my head then when you do that, these real creative geniuses also must have had hard grind, right? I, I can't think of a creative genius. I, I, it doesn't, to me, the two don't seem, like I can't imagine a creative genius without that grind. So can you talk a little bit about why, why you mention them both differently there and your views upon interacting grind and those kind of values with creation, uh, not just in poker, but uh, how that also materializes in your personal life? Yeah, I think uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I'm probably doing myself a bit of a disservice because when I look back on all the times that I spent grinding, um, you know, it, it was in, in many ways a labor of love, but there also was a creative element of, uh, you know, in real time, just being inspired to take different lines or strategic approaches and also away from the table, dissecting sessions and looking at different hands and such. And there was certainly a creative element there. Um, I guess the main thing that uh, is probably in my mind when I make statements like that is that music seems like a more purely creative art, whereas poker has certain limitations. Um, And maybe those are self-imposed limitations, Uh, but it does seem like there are different bounds to the two mediums with which you can uh, creatively express yourself. Um, And then as far as how it applies in my own life, I guess just not being especially rigid uh, with scheduling or ideas, but you, I do find that you have to strike a bit of a balance because the more that I just let my day unfold as, you know, however, um, sometimes you just find yourself laying on the couch all day and that's not fulfilling and it's not fun. Even if you have the ability to do that, it's, it's not my preferred way of life. So, uh, you know, a little bit of both, I think is helpful. So, so there is that element of that you do have that element because, you, you know, because you are very successful. Whenever I think of successful people, I, I, I kind of like have this um, like a template in my mind, like a stereotype of things that they must have, like almost like a tick box. They must have done these things in order to be successful. <laughs> One of those things in my head is they must have been meticulous planners and schedulers. Um, but I don't find that in the poker world. Like, I, I, I'm surprised when I reached out to you and I said, uh, here's my calendar. Can you book a slot for the interview? And you, and you did it. Like most, <laughs> poker, most poker players are like, what the, what the fuck did this guy just do? Did he just check? Really full full disclosure. Room? It's not a common thing for me, but I, I did <laughs> do the courtesy of, of booking it. And I'm glad I did because, uh, I think as I get older, I appreciate, um, having a semblance of scheduling a bit more it just kind of helps structure your day. Whereas if you have absolutely nothing going on, yeah, I mean, you can start to grind whenever you want or, you know, go to the gym or get food whenever, and that's all fine and good. But having certain things that are set in stone to kind of like build your day around, I, I actually quite like. Mm, mm, yeah, definitely. I mean, what part of the world did you stumble into, um, Andrew? Where was you born? What was the kind of mood like around that place as you was growing up? Uh, so I was born in New York City, and um, it was very uh, densely populated, as you'd imagine. And I don't have a ton of memories from, say, preschool, kindergarten uh, times. I guess the first like real vivid memory is, uh, I want to say it was the day I graduated first grade. 
they're kind of at the public school and just, uh, you know, being like on top of the staircase and whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, that was, that was my early years in the city. My family moved, uh, from Queens where we were in forest Hills to long Island when I was in second grade. And I have a lot more memories there, uh, getting to know the neighborhood kids and playing around freeze tag and kickball and, and all that good stuff. Um, yeah. What was you? What was you like as a kid then? Because um, when, when I grew up in a South Wales Valleys in the UK, and honestly, you could really just split the kids into two two kind of mm-hmm. groups. There was these cool kids who didn't give a fuck about anything and got really bad grades, and then there were these really swatty kids who got really good grades but never did anything cool. Like they was like completely <laughs> like polarized. I mean what was it like where you grew up in terms of um tribe tribes like what were the tribes like as a kid and where did you fit in and were there any particular challenges around that yeah no it's an interesting question i was definitely more on the shy side but um i've actually reflect on this a bit it's quite interesting i think that through elementary school i think there wasn't too much tribal divide it was more just like hey we're all kids Um, you know, we're all going through this like schooling experience together, but then as we got older, um, middle school, high school, there was more clearly defined tribes or, or cliques. And I was definitely not the cool kid, but I also really wasn't the kid getting great grades either. I would say I did well in school, um, up until the time that I found, I guess, video games, which led me to poker or more specifically computer games. And I just uh, stopped putting the effort into schoolwork. <laughs> <laughs> As you do. Did did bullying ever affect your life, i.e. Uh, you being a victim or you actually being a perpetrator? Yeah, no, I was uh, very much a victim of bullying. Um, one of my more vivid memories from middle school was uh, this one kid in particular who used to really bust my balls just for no other reason than like I was a nerd and he was a jock. Know, the, the typical archetypal uh, situation, butting heads. But it was actually kind of a blessing in retrospect. Like I really learned forgiveness at a young age and uh, kind of non-judgment. And it did force me to deal with self-worth issues because it's easy to let yourself spiral into like, you know, I'm not worthy. I have no confidence, etc. When someone is literally to your face telling you, Like, you suck, I hate you. And, you know, it's easy for kids to gang up on other kids and uh, the mob mentality type of thing will show its face every now and again. But um, I look back on those times and, you know, it would uh, would have been nice if I didn't have to go through that just in terms of the emotions that I dealt with at the time. But I do think that in retrospect, they they shaped me um, to my benefit. Now, that being said, it's not that, like, you can't, gain those values obviously without having to go through painful experiences as a child but given that i did i think i dealt with them well we you you said there that it forced you almost to um learn to adopt forgiveness which which i think is a real strong trait especially when you're younger because you know my dad just when i where i was bullied my dad just said to me don't come on until you smash him like i i was there was no forgiveness in it. There was just, you know, stand up. Otherwise, they're going to bully you some more. Um, but the the interesting thing that then you said was about self worth, about um, adopting and kind of analyzing self worth. Was that in the moment, or was did that come much later in life? Because so when I think about like cultivating self worth, it, it seems like a rare thing for like a, a child to have the. Uh, wherewithal to like go through that kind of stuff yeah i would say it definitely came later i would say that was a catalyst in many ways um and to touch on the previous point i mean i could have done a better job defending myself maybe not resorting to physical violence um, because i wasn't really physically bullied as much it was more just like mental verbal emotional type stuff um but yeah i, I definitely could have stood up for myself more than i did um but you know, just you're a kid. You, you don't really have the tools. You're just you're new to the world. It's, it's. I told you that my dad used to tell me to just 
batter them, right? Not batter them, but his, his argument wasn't. You, can, I can't, I cannot actually kind of, kind of get get away from the logic behind his argument was if a bully bullies you, they're bullying you because they see something, they feel like they've got the power, like they're, they've got power over you, right? So if you punch them, then there are, there are at least another 20, 30 kids they can bully. They'll go on to another kid who ain't going to punch them because now, now there's a consequence to bullying you, right? So there's a logic part of it. However, I'm getting battered, right? Because I'm, I'm going up to these big kids who are calling me a chink, right? And I don't even know half the time why they're doing it, and I'm, and I'm smacking them. And then I'm getting into a fight. And I remember having my first kid, Andrew, I said to him the same thing that my dad said to me. If someone bothers you, it's him. Don't give him, you know, don't give him a chance. But now I've got my second kid and I'm a lot more mature. I would never dream of giving that advice. Um, yeah. What would your advice be to your children around um, bullying? Hmm. I mean, I guess you have to kind of take it on a case by case basis to know what, what the specifics are. Um, I do see why your father would recommend that from a practical standpoint, but I think that it fails to address the root cause, which is uh, ultimately, in my opinion, is the lack of self-worth in, in the bully. It's like mm. They're taking something out on, on uh, another because they don't know how to deal with their own emotions or whatever's going on in their personal life. Um, so I think the cycle doesn't really cease to exist. It may cease to affect you in the short term, but... Yeah, I think uh, compassion really, in my opinion, is always the answer. And it's not easy really to have a child uh, deal with that. Maybe adult intervention in a school setting is yeah. perhaps more optimal on the part of a teacher or like a guidance counselor or something. But uh, I don't know. Anyway, I can imagine. I can imagine. Like I'm a, I'm a great uh, – there's a guy called David Burns who wrote a book called Feeling Good. Uh, he's like a cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapist. Mm -hmm. And he has this communication tool called The Five Secrets of Effective Communication, which is like you – know, and involved in that is a lot of empathy and uh, I feel statements. Can you imagine getting bullied in a playground and you turn around and you deploy the five secrets of effective communication? <laughs> you get your fucking head kicked in even more, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I don't, think, I don't think it's the time or the place really to <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, interesting point on that, though. Like I've just, I, I write a weekly article for Paul Fua Poker called The Pinnacle, where I, I look down the, the, the Twitter uh, handles of all high stakes poker players. You're in there, Andrew. And I look, I look down it and I kind of look what the stories are, are going on. And this isn't so much in the high stakes, but it does kind of happen a little bit. But it's, it is very prevalent in the poker industry. It's, we have a lot of bullies. We have a lot of bullies in our community. Um, now, how do you feel when you come across them, either on social media or physically at the table, um, bearing in mind when you were younger, you was a victim. Does 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 something happen to you? Hmm. It's an interesting question. Um, I do acknowledge that like bullying to some degree goes on in the poker world, but given that everyone's an adult, it's a bit different because you do have the tools to like stand up for yourself. Uh, I'm pretty friendly, and I have a lot of friends in poker. Uh, some of whom, like say, I have friend A and friend B, they would never like get along together or at least, you know, with the current scope of things. Um, so I don't know. It's interesting from my perspective. I do kind of acknowledge what you're saying, but at the same time, I think a lot of the, I guess, bully mentality is sort of uh, vaporized when people actually meet face to face at the poker table. And generally everyone's pretty respectful. And uh, I guess it kind of like speaks to, social media not being a particularly accurate representation of how life actually is lived outside of the, the technological sphere. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I guess that's how I see things. It, it, it bothers me a, a lot as well. Cause so, so like I'll see Sean Deeb and Brink Kenny going at it over the last couple of days on social media. And then I'm expecting that when they go to the table and they're, they're next to each other, that they're going to start fighting or something's going to happen, but invariably nothing happens. So it's almost like, I don't know, to me it feels like passive aggressive and, and, and it, it bugs me. I may, and maybe it yeah. bugs me because my dad taught me to stand up into people's maybe. faces. Hmm. I don't know, but uh, um, when, going back to just being kids a minute, Andrew, my daughter, Zia, she's three. She's, um, her mother's Korean. Um, I'm half Chinese. Uh, so she's very Asian looking, obviously. 
And we read a book, uh, a children's book the other day, I can't remember what it's, what it's called. And at the end of it, there's all different children of all different ethnicities from all around the world, right? Really stereotyped. And then I said to my daughter, which one is you? And there's one clear Korean looking girl, right? And I'm thinking, well, she's going to pick her. And she picked the blonde white girl in the princess dress and said, that's me. And I thought to myself, holy shit, like talking about princess, calling her a princess, reading her Disney princess book, showing her the odd Disney movie. What have I done? And, and suddenly I was aware of the ability or the inability of a child to actually think cognitively for themselves around how a personality is kind of created and art influences parents and, and how if you're not taught to think rationally about belief system stuff from a very young age you can end up being some someone you really is not by your design right um i'm interested in in your views on that and how you grew up and whether or not you think that parenting or other role models or societal conditioning kind of shaped not only who you are but the trajectory trajectory you took in life um particularly because a lot of people exist on what I call like the path of least resistance. So they're not really thinking and they're just going through the motions. And I don't see a lot of poker players doing that. Like just being a poker player for me is not on the path of least resistance. So I'm not just threw a lot of you there, like it's spewed it all over. He has a lot to unpack. Yeah, well, one thing I'll say is that I think uh, the situation with your daughter, it actually kind of to me speaks to the beauty and simplicity of like a child's perspective is that they look, they look past uh, race and religion and whatever. And she's just like, Oh, I'm a princess. That's a princess. She's not looking at like the skin color or like, um, you know, any cultural uh, differences. I think that's actually quite beautiful. Um, but I, I do also understand what you're saying, um, with respect to the rest of the situation. And I guess with my own parents, you know, I think they did an amazing job. They were certainly very loving and supportive, which, you know, I can only speak from my own experience, but I think those are kind of the most important things. And were it not for that, at least the way that I'm hardwired or soft wired, depending on how you want to look at things, uh, I may not have had the uh, ability to find myself playing poker professionally because, I don't know, it was their support and acceptance of uh, me choosing an alternative career path that allowed me to, you know, fumble a bit in the beginning and eventually find my bearings. Um, yeah, there's a a lot that can always be done better, I think, with parents, but I'm also not a parent, so I don't yet in my life uh, appreciate the challenges that parents go through, and, you know, I think my parents did the absolute best they could with what what they had at the time, and I love them very much for it. What what about outside of your parents? So, you know, if... I know I'm very, I'm, I'm reflecting a lot of my own personal history here to try to mm-hmm. en- engage a conversation a bit. But um, mm-hmm. with me, w- when I got bullied in, in school for being Chinese and everybody was white and I was like the only Asian person in a 3,200 strong uh, valley, I've never wanted to be white. So white as much as like, I, I just wanted to be the same as everybody else. And, and, and that drive to not to be bullied you know, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, if I'm like them, they won't bully me. So I really need to be like them. And all of a sudden, I'm making decisions about who I am and what I'm going to be at such a young age, um, which, you know, a lot of them are positive traits in my life now, and a lot of them are negative. Um, was, what about the elements outside of your parenting that shaped who you are? Did, was, you, was you kind of like going through life consciously aware of that? Or do you look back on it now and think, oh, yeah, that kind of influenced me a little bit? Mm, I don't know if I was particularly conscious of it at the time, like say from peers and friend groups and such. I do think that I was, and even to some degree still am, too impressionable. It's like it's easy for me to put myself in someone else's shoes and see their perspective and maybe a little bit lose sight of my own perspective. I think that's probably something that started at a young age, maybe just by virtue of who I am and perhaps also to some degree due to not having uh, been told like how to sort of parse through preferences and belief systems and like, Hey, this is where like 
you know, you start and you end and these are other people. And I don't know, it, it's kind of hard to break it all down. I'm definitely not a psychoanalyst, but <laughs> there's, there's a lot there, um, you know, growing up in, uh, you know, I'd imagine a, a similar enough environment that we both did and uh, having that, that peer pressure to like conform or to be yourself. I do think that where you're seeing in our lifetimes, or at least I, I feel like I'm witnessing less of a push for conformity and more of a, uh, an easing or relaxation for everyone to be themselves and even an embracing of that. And I think that's, that's a healthy balance to strike. Mm, I think that the internet has a, has a lot to do with that. I mean, obviously it has its negative aspects, but as it's like huge positive aspects as well, you yeah. know, um, what, um, did you have any jobs before you played poker or did you just go from school straight into poker? And what was your, what was, I know you was very young back then. Uh, I have an 18 year old who hasn't got a clue what he wants to do with life. I didn't know until I was 35. What were your thoughts around, oh shit, I'm, I'm moving from kind of being a teenager to a man, um, particularly around what I have to do for a living? Yeah, so I worked in a bowling alley for a couple of years and I was just hosting birthday parties for children. It was far from the ideal job, but I was very much in the bowling scene. Like I uh, got into it at a pretty young age and I was on the, the high school team and so on. Um, so it was not that hard to find myself um, being employed by the alley at some point. Um, yeah, way more challenging than poker to corral like 37 year olds and be like, hey, you know, now we're going over here. Or like, you know, put your shoes on. Um, so I have a lot of respect for teachers just in the sense that I had to deal with all these children for that short period. I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. I was pretty confident when I found poker after um, I, I guess to take a step back, something I find in my own life is I'll become passionate about something. And then oftentimes that passion will to some degree die off. So like I'll find a YouTube channel I really like or a hobby or, um, you know, a genre of music and I'll get really into it for a short time and I'll like familiarize myself with it and kind of investigate and research. And then whether or not that passion dies off after I guess like the quote unquote honeymoon phase of that um, specific thing, I'll know whether or not it's something that I actually want to further pursue. And with poker, it very much didn't die off. So to me, that was a pretty clear indicator, whether consciously or unconsciously at the time, uh, it, you know, it kind of, uh, I guess in many ways just rolled out the carpet in front of me. It was like, all right, you know, just keep taking the next step. It's a, uh, it's all very logical. Um, but up until that point, nothing really spoke to me like that or inspired me to that same degree. Can you just share with us, um, just picking up some milestone moments, I guess, from you start to play poker and then you become professional. What were some of the light bulb stroke milestone moments that led to that decision? Yeah, so in the beginning, uh, I guess like reading some of the books, like Super System, um, Antonio's book, Helmuth's book, just familiarizing myself with like the ways that professionals think were very emblematic of like light bulb esque moments. So I was like, oh, this thing, like this pattern that I recognize, I now understand how they see it. And I could sort of start to, you know, build my strategy around the the beginnings of what I had, I like, guess the seeds I'd planted. Uh after that, I think just starting to uh, insert myself more in the community. So like finding the two plus two poker forums, um, meeting people from there. Uh, Aaron Jones was one in particular. Through him, I met a lot of other people and you know, starting to have Skype conversations and eventually going to meet those people and going to live tournaments. And I'll, it all kind of just streamlined. And then from there, once I had sort of uh, built like a network of poker friends, I, you know, can very clearly remember like, okay, the first time I had a five figure score, the first time I had a six figure score, the first time I actually traveled outside the U S to go to a poker tournament, the first time I traveled outside the U S by myself, like a lot of these, uh, I guess in retrospect, uh, events that don't stand out relative to the other experiences I've had 
were very much groundbreaking at the time. You, there's, there's a couple of things I want to touch on there. One of them was you said you read the books and you started to uh, say to yourself, oh, this is how they think. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's, a, there's an opposite to that, whereas, oh, this is what they do. Mm -hmm. what, 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 is the, what is the big difference here between looking at what's, how someone is thinking and then adopting a, a thought process like that or learning from that as opposed to, oh, that's what he's doing. I'm just going to do that. Yeah, I think that's, that's kind of a, what, perhaps one of the more, more relevant things in poker, I guess, to me is, um, you know, you can see people's actions at face value, but dissecting the thought process behind it will often be, I guess, the bridge to understanding of, you know, why they're operating in that way. I guess the way I see it is like thought is a precursor to action. So um, having the understanding of, you know, or X, Y, or Z play is good in this particular situation is, is great. But unless you really can dissect it and uh, have those variables understood, it'll be challenging to uh, relate that information to situations that might have different nuances or just completely different elements to it. I think that's kind of just a uh, helpful way for aspiring poker players to uh, deal with new information that they get is to try to break it down to its most fundamental form and then see, oh, okay, you know, this was done because of this flush blocker or, um, you know, he had this particular semi-bluffing hand or, or whatever it may be, uh, just throwing out random examples. Mm, yeah. It sounds like as you grew up and, f and found people like Aaron and, and, and your, your network expanded, that the large bulk of your growing up into a man kind of happened in the poker industry. Um, wish you, wish you, were, I mean, it's a difficult question. You want to like, it. like, like I'm trying to vision, like how, how, how does, cause the poker world is a bubble, right? Like it's a special world. So like in this hero's journey, for example, I'm saying like the ordinary world of Andrew is the bowling alley, right? That's the ordinary world. Like the, the world's expecting Andrew to go work in a bowling alley, right? But he, he doesn't, he ends up working in the poker industry. And if I was to canvas a hundred people just randomly down the street and ask them whether the poker world was a special world or like, or, or an ordinary world, I'm pretty sure like most of them are going to say it's, it's special. How, yes. how, how did that shape you pluses and minuses growing up in this bubble as opposed to growing up in the, in the real world? Cause I know it takes a lot of your time and effort to po po poker takes a lot of time and effort. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I, I think you definitely grow up a bit faster in some ways and much slower in others. So like, because you're doing really well financially aspects of one's life that can be, uh, masked with, uh, finances will often stagnate. So like say organization, for example, um, that was something that I was really bad at because I just didn't have to be good at it. And it was really easy when all of my peers were similarly bad. So it wasn't like, oh, I don't know how to play paired boards and three bet pots or, or whatever, where, you know, my peers were good at it. I was also good at that. Whereas with uh, uh, organization, they were also god awful. And we were all just, you know, spending money to, to mask that. Um, uh, what's the right way to say it? Uh, inefficiency. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The best word I can come up with. Um, but I'll just think for a second on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it was definitely interesting growing up in that world. Like it's, it, it does become your new ordinary at a certain point, and it kind of has to for you to stick around. Um, and it doesn't mean that you like you lose appreciation for it. Um, but I do also think, to some degree. Uh, a lot of people in society have this sort of option where they can, um, you know, make more for themselves in their life. And a lot of people just don't take that jump. And I, I really, I kind of hate saying it because it almost sounds a little bit elitist. Like, Oh, I did this thing. Other people could have done it too, but it's not specific to poker. It's really just like 
pursuing your dreams and your passions and, you know, really whatever form that looks like. And for some people, that ordinary that they grow up in will continue to be their, their most fulfilling life. And they don't really need to you know, go so far beyond that. But I would say for the majority, a lot of people don't go beyond it because of some underlying fear or uh, just lack of knowledge or, or experience, I guess. Yeah, it's like uh, my son now at 18. Like I, I'm just telling him, you will never, you'll never know what you're going to do right now. So just get a job, right? Just get a job so you can understand what it's like to work. You can pay your mom some rent, you know, you can, uh, and you can just get your foot on that rung of the ladder. But just so, but, but let's say he gets a job as an accountant. Just, just be very careful. You don't be an accountant. <laughs> like you're not in a pub one day and someone say, what do you do for a living? You say, I'm an accountant because you started just as a job and you got stuck in it. And then if you're in the job for like 20, 30 years, suddenly the poker world looks like a very, very special world mm-hmm. because so, cause ordinary has been so ingrained in your life. Like I imagine, like how long did you work in a bowling alley for? Mm, a year and a half maybe. Right. If imagine, that... imagine if you worked in a bowling alley for 20 years and now suddenly you're given the opportunity to be a professional poker player. Yeah, well, I guess that's the irony of it, right? It's like the opportunity was never really given to me. I had to kind of take it. It, it yeah, was yeah. always there. Yeah. It, it just required the... The dedication and it's easier when you're younger because I was still living with my parents I didn't have any expenses there was no overhead to, to deal with um, I I do acknowledge that it's a lot more challenging for adults to be like okay I'm just gonna quit my job when I have this monthly nut to take care of uh, you know at the first of every every new month yeah that's uh, it's a different a different situation for me the downside was just okay maybe I do go back to the bowling alley or maybe I do go back to school. Yeah, it's, it's, you're right. You know, as you get older and you get wives and husbands and kids, the fear factor grows more because you have more responsibility and you feel you have more to lose. But, uh, you know, the, the point remains that there's nothing stopping you. It's just a question of, is that a path to yes? Yeah. What does it look like? What have I got to do and sacrifice? Am I willing to do it? You know, and, and most people, come to the answer of no, I'm not willing to do it without even consulting the party. Yes. It, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just, you're just stuck in it. It's really difficult. What, well, what, well, what was it like though? Witnessing this special world, like, you know, like one minute you're playing poker, I guess on your computer, right? You're like playing online poker. So it's a very isolated thing. Mm-hmm. Um, what was it like when it opened up a bit and you realized that there were actually a, a, a mass of people making massive amounts of money doing this as a living online what was that like and what was it like when you went to a live tournament or a series and you're like holy crap this is another kind of world like what were these first glimpses of these special worlds like for you well i'd say the first part just having the understanding that people were doing this and making a lot of money at it was kind of ingrained with just my introduction to poker because it was around the time that poker was televised and uh you know it didn't it didn't take much just opening the poker client and seeing people with big stacks to understand like, okay, you know, people are doing this and they're winning at it. Um, I guess the depths to which people were succeeding was revealed over time. Um, but it was much more profound for me to go to the live tournaments and meet, uh, you know, put faces to some of the names that I knew from online. Like, Oh, we saw you a hundred rebuy for the last, you know, however many days. And now here we are hanging out. That was, Uh, very much a turning point for me and I guess if nothing else just having the camaraderie with people who were sharing a similar life path was really cathartic because the challenges that you go through in poker are not easily relatable to other fields like specifically the volatility of hey sometimes you win sometimes you lose like nobody understands that unless they're a gambler Mm -hmm. you just it it doesn't compute it's like uh, if you you know have a regular like nine to five or whatever, you don't just flip a coin at the end of the day to see if you get your paycheck or not. Yeah. So, yeah, um, having uh, I guess that that commonality amongst the the other grinders was really nice. Just to not not even so much like be consoled in any way or have them have sympathy for you, but just to know like 
you know what this is like and I know what this is like and we share this feeling that other people can't relate to. Just knowing that someone else out there has the similar experience to you is very nice. Mm -hmm. And what, so if we're going to say in terms of um, their story archetype, you know, of starting off in an ordinary world and the hero wants to reach their special world, um, as that kid who was working in the bowling alley, um, whether or not you had a goal, um, like the Hobbit to get the ring to Mordor, like whether you had a goal to get to the world series of poker or not is, is irrelevant, really. It became your special world. What's your special world right now? Like, are you, cause you said earlier on that poker became quickly became your ordinary world. It's an interesting question, I guess. Uh, what do I strive for right now? Well, I really just, I, I'm always seeking to become a better version of myself. So like, I guess, aspects of myself that I feel are inefficient, I seek to eliminate. Um, and I guess in a broader sense, like I would like to have a child and have a uh, you know, blossoming family. I think that's uh, on the very near horizon for me. I look forward to that. And I would also really like to uh, usher in the, uh, the extraterrestrials from other worlds so we can start to become a uh a universal family not just a uh earthbound family but i guess starting on earth is a good place good place to start <laughs> before before we move on to et um and we will when i th i mean i'm thin slicing here right because you know uh, my my time with you has been has been very sparse okay so um bear, bear with me on this but um, what, but what, but if someone was to say to me, "Hey, what do you think Andrew Andrew's um, special world is?" The way my 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 mind goes is normally when I think of like an ordinary world and a special world, I, I do think of like the bowling alley to the poker world, or um, the bowling alley to like the NHL, or the bowling alley to the NFL, or the bowling alley to like being a top surgeon or something. I don't know. Like that's how I'm kind of looking. But then with you, I think it's. I think more mindset than actual activity. So your ordinary world was, this is Andrew with this set of beliefs and these behaviors and these habits. And then your special world became, this is Andrew with this set of beliefs, these values, this way of thinking. And, and, and now you're, 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 you're kind of like getting your, because the, the, Joseph Cannell says like the hero gets a special world, he changes, he's transformed, and then he takes that back to the ordinary world and kind of spreads a message, right? And that's how I see you. Like it's like you've you've grown and evolved, and you're taking that back to poker and saying, "Oh, this is how I've evolved, and I'm going to share it with you, so you can maybe do the same." Um, does that sound like I'm near near? Am I getting somewhere there? Yeah. No. I mean, that that seems uh, completely reasonable. Like I, I, I guess it speaks to what I was mentioning about identifying aspects of myself that I feel are inefficient, or maybe not even so much inefficient, but just not relevant and growing from there and uh as far as like sharing them with the poker world mm, i don't know i think i was maybe pushier with my beliefs say probably almost like 10 years ago but i don't actually see really the value in um trying to push beliefs onto others because you don't really know where someone's at in their own process in their own life i think like exposure is cool but um yeah, I would never want to as fa falsely assume that someone should be living a certain way. Uh, you know, you just never really know, like in the grand scheme of things, where any particular situation or belief is going to lead somebody. Obviously, there's certain things that we sort of collectively identify as inefficient or harmful, and we should seek to eliminate behaviors like that. But um, as far as more personal preference type stuff, it, it really is just kind of up in the air as I see it. Yeah, I, I wasn't I wasn't um, espousing that you would or will push your beliefs on people. More right. of yeah. more of I, I I I've read comments in the past of I I shared the table with uh, Chewy today. Wow, what an impact he had on me! And all you're doing is just sitting there and and, and interacting with him. And I'm I'm you know I'm kind of assuming here, and it's just a big slice of this. Would he have had a different 
impression before? Like, would you be talking to him about Zen-like stuff, about meditation, about yoga, about health? I mean, like, you know, sometimes people can get that vibe, like, like the energy of people straight away. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. This guy has got something that I back to envy again or inspiration or whatever you want to call it. And then the questions follow. What are you doing? Like, how have you changed? Blah, 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 blah. I mean, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So you're in the poker world. Uh, you've made it. You've decided to be a professional poker player. Um, and then, you know, we can all go on to Hendon Mob uh, and, and, and see how you did, you know, trajectory-wise, like with your tournaments, you know, mm-hmm. less about your cash game uh, stuff. But what's happening about your life? What, what has happened about Andrew, uh, uh, his personality, you know, as you're going through those poker years to where you are today? Uh, wow. Um, a lot of things. <laughs> I definitely think that, like, anytime I have a lot of success, more so in tournaments because it's, it's more pivotal. Uh, also, there is that, you know, I guess public acknowledgement. It always, for me, is a time to, like, pause a bit and reflect and kind of just, like, um, take it all in, uh, and just, I don't know, I guess see where I'm at with my life and if I like the trajectory I'm on. Um, oftentimes I feel like it is in some ways a validation, although there's obviously a component of variance and you can't discount that. It does often feel like, um, it, it is a validation of like the hard work put in and, um, to, you know, continue on your path. But, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a challenging question to answer because it's, you know, you're, we're always changing day to day, moment to moment. Um, I guess the one thing I would point out uh, about, you know, meeting people at the table is for me, I never want to lose sight of the fact that even though poker is my ordinary, it still has that very extraordinary vibe, especially the World Series, because for so many people, it's not their ordinary. Mm. And to not, dull it down to make it seem like it's, you know, just another day at the office type of thing and to make it like, uh, special, like it once was for me and like it is for them. I like that, that element of things. Now, as the summer goes on, that can become more challenging, uh, <laughs> because we're in and out of there every day. And, you know, especially depending on how you're running, whatever you try not to let that affect you, but you know, we are only human and everybody has some sort of breaking point with things, but Um, yeah, I guess I just try to always stay humble and, uh, always consider that that perspectives I have may fall away in time and others that I don't may crop up. So you never really know how life is going to shape you. You just kind of have to be, uh, prepared to, to meet it with an open mind and an open heart and, and do the best you can to, to integrate the experiences that you have. I know it was a really challenging question, so I'll try to uh, break it up a little bit. I'll get a pickaxe to it and, and, and smash it up a little bit. Let's do so, it. so um, I mean, thinking about my own life, generally when I – let me think about something. Uh, so, okay, so a, a, life, a, life, a lifelong issue of mine is anger, and, and, and I can trace that all the way back to being bullied as a kid. Mm-hmm. That that anger and that deter- and, and my dad, like we said, like go on smash him. So so now today, although I'm not physically violent with people, that smash him mentality comes out in different ways, right? Mm-hmm. It could it come out in um, uh, abusing people verbally by being kind of like more aggressive by trying to intellectualize, uh, intellectually dominate someone, um, uh, just like losing my frustration very very quickly, all different kinds of different ways. But then learning to meditate and then putting that into practice for several years and then realizing that, Oh, hang on a minute. Like I'm not, I'm not getting angry anymore. (laughs) Like I I can say to myself, that is a, is a massive change in my life that I can, that I can pinpoint to me re actually reading self-help books and everyone banging on about meditation being the thing. And then maybe literally Googling uh, meditation and finding transcendental meditation, right? So that is an example. So has it been like a catalyst like that in your life that led to some change 
that then acted almost like a springboard to a thousand other micro changes that you made in your life, but there was a, a core thing that changed. Well, specifically with meditation, I can recall the first time my brother actually introduced me to it and we watched a guided meditation and I just had like a very profound breakthrough kind of experience where I just realized like, oh, like I'm kind of getting a glimpse of my true nature for the first time. Um, but there's so many of those experiences I feel within my own life uh, as it pertains to poker, especially where maybe it happens after, like I was saying, with big wins you reflect or even more so uh, for character shaping things and character development, big losses, or even just conversations I have with, uh, with peers where, you know, we don't see strategic things the same way or, or even life things, philosophical things. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, is that kind of answering, I guess, what you're, what you're going for? Um, yeah, in a way, I mean, did you, did you pick meditation? Cause I used it as an, as an example, or was meditation one of the key, uh, things that kind of, cause I remember going on a landmark forum, um, in London, like, uh, many, many years ago. And the woman said, you'll, you'll, You'll find three. You'll find three things in your life that really change the trajectory of your life. And I know it's a far reach for the the woman to say that. And then when she says it, there's a bit of cognitive bias associated with it when you start thinking about it yourself. But then I was like, oh wow, mine was a. I find out that I'm half past Chinese. B. My parents move me from to one from one country to the next. Um, and then C. I stop drinking alcohol. Like almost like events that led me to a completely different world. So an example you said is um, you meditated and you realized your true nature for the first time. Or maybe you didn't say first time, but you realized your true nature. Like to mm -hmm. me, that is massive because, yeah, that, massive. Because, because that then becomes a question which you can answer actually is, well, what was your like before? What was your, what was your non true nature? Um, and what is your true nature? And then what did you do? And what changed after you realized, I've just fucking found Lucky Chewy. Or, or maybe, maybe uh, Lucky Chewy was not your true nature and you just found Andrew. I mean, I don't know, but like what? Yeah, I mean, I guess the labels mean less than, than the experience yeah. itself. Well, I'm thinking more metaphorical, yeah. But. Yeah, no, I, I, do, I do understand a bit more of what you're saying now. I guess um, instead of trying to break it up into like it was meditation, it was yoga, it was whatever, uh, to me it was more of just like a lifestyle change and just like an overarching perspective change where uh, it was experiences like that that led me to go about my day-to-day -day differently. And, you know, the more uh, incremental changes like that that you have, all of a sudden you find yourself, it's like you're a completely new person. So, um, you know, meditation would be one of those. Yoga definitely was one of those. Um, diet was one of those. Uh, I did party a bit uh, when I came to Vegas initially, but it was never something that uh, I felt I couldn't go without. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure why I'm challenged to answer this, this question seemingly in the way that you're looking for, but I guess it was just a lot of, a lot of incremental changes that eventually you know, stacked up on top of each other lead to it. Uh, seemingly very different experience as a human. So if somebody's watching this and they've, they've, they've spent time around you at the table and they've seen how you compose yourself, um, not, not about how you play poker, but how you compose yourself, how you speak to other people, um, they've watched your, your vlogs on, on, and listened to your meanderings about life and, and, and what you think in that, in that respect. And, and even in your training videos, your poker training videos, you always try to insert an element of life teaching as, as well, right? So yeah. for, those, for those people watching who are like, wow, I want to be, be like that, you know, like I want to understand what my true nature is, what would your advice be to them? I would say that it's – it's good as like a starting block to be inspired by someone, but, um, and even if you want to sort of follow in their footsteps, that's cool too, but really to, you know, honor your individuality and like figure out what your own passions are. And, you know, just someone once told me success is just knowing the next step. And I really like that quote. 
because it's easy to let yourself get bogged down by the past or the future instead of just staying present and being like, okay, now I have to do this. And sometimes it seems like to me in life, you only figure out where to put your left foot after your right foot moves forward. Mm. And it's just taking things step by step and, um, you know, moving uh, with the direction that your passions and your, and your excitement is leading you uh, is sometimes just the, the simplest way to go about things. Yeah, I heard a similar quote there at a seminar in San Diego last week. It was, it was some, I'm going to butcher it, but it was something like your future experiences are embedded in your next experience. It's almost like you need to, you need to think and then you need to take action. And then in the action, you'll be like cl- more clear on what your next action is and on and on and on yeah, and on. I think action is a very integral part of this whole process because sometimes it seems like you're inspired by something just to get you to start moving. And you don't really know exactly where you're going to end up or what that's going to look like. And your mind very well may change along the process once you start going. I think just um, not, not being stagnant is kind of the most important thing. Yeah. Again, at that same seminar that a quote that came out that um, fits in nicely there is, uh, I think it was Tom Billiou. He said, ambition is nothing without drive. Hmm. So it's, it's almost like, yeah, you can have your dreams, but you've really got to take action. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. nothing's going to happen, which, which you did. I mean, to get, out of the, uh, to get out of the bowling alley, you had to take tremendous amounts of action, whether that, w- whether that was small incremental steps or big steps. It sounds like it was small incremental steps. Um, that's really, yeah. really important. Incremental steps that over you know, a particular timeline are quite, quite large steps. Yeah. But initially, just like, okay, I'm going to start playing online. And then, okay, instead of like spending my free time doing X, Y, or Z, watching TV shows or whatever, I'm going to read poker forums. And then instead of, you know, uh, going out on weekends, I'm just going to play tournaments and grind catch games and those type of things. Uh, you know, there's definitely uh, paying your dues or whatever, sowing the seeds to, to later harvest uh, as part of the whole process. Let's get the kazoo out and give a shout out to our sponsors, Run It Once. <laughs> The legendary Phil Galfon founded Run It Once Poker and it quickly became the coolest place to play online poker in the world. Remember back in the day when Ivy Poker promised you a seat next to Phil Ivy? Well, at Run It Once, you actually do get to sit next to Phil Galfon, who plays and streams on the site regularly. If you head to once.run forward slash hero play today, then you can pick up a 100% welcome bonus up to a ceiling of 600 euros. There are two elements to this deposit bonus that make me want to steal my three-year-old daughter's ISA fund. First, it never expires as long as you play one under every 30 days. And second, all of your deposits during your first 30 days count towards a bonus. Run It Once Poker may be a cool, fun place to play, but it doesn't half put a smile on your face when you win some money. Run It Once also helps you with that because they happen to be the home of the most banging online training site this side of Mars. Run It Once training gives you the chance to learn from some of the best poker players in the world with two brand spanking new training videos added daily. If you sign up through once.run forward slash hero learn, you will get access to three, three elite videos, including one from the Yoda of poker himself, Mr. Phil Galfon. Now, back to another Yoda of poker and today's hero, Andrew Lucky Chewy Lichtenberger. I read on your, uh, I think it was like Twitter or a, a blog, can't remember which, you said Zen like life is a hot potato. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what is Zen and uh, why is it a hot potato? I think I said Zen like life is like a game of hot potato. Oh, okay. Yeah. But um, I was reading this book and it was talking about Zen and just how the whole philosophy from the author's perspective is kind of meant to uh, just highlight the, the silliness of life and the paradoxical nature of it. And I don't know, it just occurred to me that like, that's kind of what like hot potato was as a kid. Like it's just the silly game. It has no real purpose to it. And yeah, it's just, uh, it just is what it is type of thing. And I don't know, it, it, it just makes sense to me. There's, I guess, you know, you hear this a lot with sort of Zen type philosophies, like, oh, you can't explain it, you just have to experience it. But that, that truly is how I, how I see this, uh, this element of it. 
it's like, yeah, it's just like this funny thing. There's, there's nothing really more to it. It's just take it at face value. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, was there a moment if we like, there's a, there's a um, part of this story archetype where the hero always rejects the call, um, because they're afraid uh, of doing it or, or whatever. Um, with poker being your call, like, the poker in going, come on in, Andrew. You know, the water's warm. Was there ever, ever a time where you rejected it, where you felt like giving up and, and not doing it anymore? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I guess, uh, you know, in alignment with uh, the archetype of the story it or the outline of the story, it's it kind of makes the eventual success that much sweeter when you have those trials and tribulations and... Um, I don't know, for me, it was, I guess, relatively smooth, but there were certainly times where I had a lot of doubt about whether or not this was something I wanted to do. But at the end of the day, every time I would have, say, a big losing day or a losing session and start to doubt myself, there was just a part of me that was shining brighter than whatever negative feelings I was having that I knew, like... I could do this. And if I just keep dedicating myself, I will eventually succeed. And I think probably at the core of this and, you know, most, I guess, heroes journeys or uh, life paths, careers, whatever is just like the undying love for something. And if you don't have that, it seems hard to like keep trudging. But if you do have that, then it's almost like there's nothing else you'd rather do. And nothing else seems logical. Um, and nothing else certainly seems as easy. So it's like, if you truly love it, what else would you do? You know, even if you fail, even if you, you know, have those, uh, those experiences that aren't so preferential, they teach you a lot. And eventually, you know, it's, it's ultimately the, the whole gamut of experiences that allow you to succeed. So it sounds like your, your doubts has been mainly around whether or not you could succeed at the game. Was there ever doubt about being in the industry? So, so, so for example, when I worked on the railway for 20 years, I would say for 15 years, I loved it. Like I was like, this is great. I want to be CEO. This is fantastic. And then, you know, Jack Canfield, uh, who wrote the chicken soup for the soul says to me, you know, you could do anything you want in life. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, what? well, I don't want to do this. And then, all of a, <laughs> and, then, and then all of a sudden I hate my environment, right? Mm. Where do you stand on, on that in terms of the call? Like was there ever, a, was there ever anything about the poker industry or what you were doing that, that didn't feel right for you? Or, have you, or is that love for it like always overridden anything that may have come negative? Yeah, I would say the, the love has always overridden everything else. I, I guess I, I didn't have especially strong thoughts on the industry as a whole when I was first getting into it, uh, largely, I guess, due to exposure of, or, or lack thereof. I, you know, I just didn't really know enough about the going-ons of the poker world to really uh, comment on, on anything. I did quickly learn that, like, the way poker is portrayed in rounders isn't how it actually is. You know, it's a great story. You know, it's... I'm, I'm sure there are, you know, those... Uh, those type of situations, but certainly wasn't the path I took. Now, poker, you, you can't get away from money when when we talk about poker, right? Yeah, for so, sure. If, so mind if I ask you a random question about money? Sure. So uh, don't forget, you can fold if you want, okay? Okay. I don't like to fold, Lee. <laughs> what is it about your character that hasn't enabled you to make more money? Hmm. It's a very interesting question. Um, I'd like to think that I'm maximizing my earn, but I'm probably not. And I guess maybe it's one of those questions where if I knew the answer, then I would make the change. I mean, the simple thing is just say, oh, well, you just play more hours. But something that I've uh, become quite adamant about in my own poker career as time has gone on is that 
uh, the more hours I play, the more my play suffers. So like say, you know, uh, in a week, like my, my hundredth hour, or I guess that's not realistic, but in whatever time frame, your hundredth hour is going to be less effective poker than your 10th hour. And I don't know, that seems to me to be uh, fairly true across the board. Maybe some people would disagree. Um, but I also do think that like your 10th hour is going to be more effective than your first hour because you kind of get in flow and like you're refamiliarized with like the player pool you're in and population tendencies and, and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe I should fold or was that an answer? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> it was sort of an, it was sort of an answer. Let me ask you another one. Okay. Is someone who earns very little a sexual turn on or turn off? I mean, in theory, it shouldn't really matter, right? Like, I think if you start tying money into sexuality to that degree, it's probably not especially healthy. Hmm. I would, you know, it, I like to say in my own life, I've um, been sexually attracted based on personality and and physicality more so than uh, career or earning potential. I was actually having this conversation. The person I interviewed before you is James Obst, and we was hmm. we was having a similar kind of conversation around like it's not that it's not important i think his question was slightly different it was um would you like a, a manic overachiever or a kind underachiever type of thing uh, and then the the conversation flowed towards well it's really not important if they if they're overachieving or if they're successful or not but then it was kind of like well is that true like would you would you would your would one of the values of like your parameters of who you would like to fall in love with or who you define love by would would it be someone who was successful like because there's a lot of merits around that right so i guess rather than the use sexual turn or how do you feel about being in a relationship with someone who's like not interested in dri in, in driving ambition in terms of the stereotypical view of it versus uh, someone who's like really driven to succeed yeah i think those like side questions are more relevant and i guess with uh, success as it pertains to career and like being driven oftentimes that that seems to mean the person's going to be more fulfilled now there's certainly people who work endless hours and are not fulfilled mm. but putting them aside i would at least you know i would say in my current relationship my girlfriend's very driven and um you know she's got her career path very um firmly set out in front of her and uh you know that makes her happy i think it's it's nice to have that in your life because you're not, you're not always searching. Whereas I know other people in my life are kind of searching and uh, you know, it's a, it's a trial. Like I'm sure when you left the railway, it was like, okay, now, you know, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Or for me, before I found poker, it was that uncertainty of, you know, just not, not really being clear on where you're going and not even really being particularly clear on what action to take. Um, so yeah, I would say it's definitely a positive in, in a relationship. It's almost like the, the haze that comes with not having clarity consumes so much time and energy in your life. It's yeah. just so much. It, you said earlier on about the times when you end up on the settee because you're not as organized as you want to be. Like for me, that haze of, I don't know what I'm doing leads straight to the city. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like. Especially yeah. these days, these days with binge watching Peaky Blinders or Game of Thrones or whatever it becomes apparent to you. So I think that's. Uh, yeah, I mean, the access to content is really disproportionate, I feel, at this time. Mm. And specific different kinds of content. Like when I grew up with just TV, it was like, all right, here's the subset of channels. If you missed a show, it's not going to be on till later or tomorrow. It's obviously a lot different now. And I also find that when I when I fall into that trap of too much consumption, I need to draw back and start doing creative things to strike that balance. Or I really start to, uh, it just starts to weigh on me. Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm a rule guy. So I, I give myself one, one show a day, but if I fall behind on my work, like I did this morning, I can't watch our show. Cause I, I have to backfill that space with the work I missed this morning. Like I have to have that rule because I'm so drawn to this, like this, this, this world, that is different. This, the special worlds that, you know, the star Wars coming in December and, 
you know, the, all this kind of stuff. I, I am just so drawn to it. I don't know why. Mm. Maybe I need to answer that question myself in an interview. Yeah, you should. Uh, um, <laughs> on the financial side of things, like me and Liza just come away from that seminar. Like I said, it was in San Diego. It's an influencer seminar, this uh, entrepreneur called Brendan Bouchard. And we come away and we said to each other, right, what is it that we want in life, right? Like, what do we want to achieve in life? Let's, let's find that. Let's not worry about our constraints. What is it that we want to achieve in life? And then we, we kind of, and it's complicated for us because we have family on two different continents, right? So I have a son in, in the UK and I have a daughter in LA, right? So when we map out everything that we need, the one denominator, common denominator that stops us from doing all the things that we want to do is money. Like we, mm-hmm. we, we cannot escape it. It is there. It is real. And in order for us to earn the money to do the things that we want to do, we have to make certain sacrifices, but the money is there, right? What I'm interested in is, and I have a very, very, very bad, poor relationship, mindset, belief around money, right? What are your, what is your mindset and beliefs around money being? Like, have they been healthy? Have they not been from like growing up uh, as a kid? Um, and how has that changed as you've gone into money? And I'm interested in your in your thoughts of the uh, the articles that talk about the limit of um, of 250 grand being the limit where your happiness will not kind of increase as direct proportion to how much you earn. Like like it's almost like you plateau at a certain level of money and your happiness doesn't grow. So again, I asked you a million questions there, but I'm sure you. Oh, can these, these are good questions. They're they're definitely all intertwined. Uh, I guess I would say that kind of backtracking from the last question, by the way, should I, should I open my blinds or is this lighting? Yeah. Alter? Yeah. Go on. Open. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. starting to look a bit like a zebra. Yeah. <laughs> it is a great animal. Oh, it is a true fact. Actually, zebras are the animal that kills more people in zoos globally. Hmm. Mm, yeah. Little side. Very interesting. I didn't know that. Okay, the lighting is just weird, I guess. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so I do think that, you know, it's contingent on a lifestyle to some degree, like how much you're spending and what your, your overheads are. But I do think that there is, there almost certainly has to be a limitation on uh, net worth in which your, your happiness doesn't increase. Like obviously going from $0 to $10,000 means a lot more than going from a hundred to 110,000, right? Hmm. just seems like it has to be that way. Um, I guess some people, uh, you know, I would put myself in this, ca- most people probably uh, get joy out of making money. But I also think that a lot of it for me is a byproduct of feeling like I succeeded at the thing that I dedicate a lot of time to. So like to uh, use the same thing as an example, like, you know, if I, increase my net worth by whatever percent from having done really well in the tournament. That's just a good feeling. Even if I know that like, yes, I got really lucky and you know, there were all these components that I didn't have control over the ones that I did have control over. I was able to execute well on, um, as far as like spending and, and whatnot, I've definitely gotten more responsible with it. I was not at all responsible kind of stemming back to the previous conversation about not being organized and like, you know, paying personal assistance and and so on. Just not really having ever developed those life skills uh, cost me a lot of money Hmm. um, in in my earlier years and, you know, like planning ahead and uh, I I call it like being a real person, like being a real person really helps (laughs) with money. You don't find yourself like, oh, it accrued all this interest on this thing I never paid. Like this doesn't happen to like quote unquote real people because yeah. they, they have to. They have to like know that, you know, my finances are in order. Whereas poker does provide you the luxury, at least successful poker provides you the luxury of not having to do that. Um, I do think it's interesting though, um, where I can relate the experience of really having to buckle down and grind and you know, very clearly defining like this is the path ahead. Once you choose pokers for you, you've shown that you can be successful and you know this is what you're going to do. Um, not even really setting like a particular monetary goal, but to me, it's interesting that 
when you have that very clearly defined path, your life is pretty simple and straightforward. You're just going to keep playing. You're going to keep doing whatever other things keep your life in balance and you're just going to move forward. Whereas when you reach a certain level of success, um, perhaps, you know, maybe where that net worth inflection point lies, your life path is no longer so clear. And to me, I've found that even though the freedom is wonderful and I, I would never want to trade it, it does sometimes make things more confusing because, okay, you know, you, you hypothetically you wake up tomorrow. Now you have all the money in the world. You can do whatever you want. You spend one day lying on the couch watching whatever TV show or YouTube channel and you know, you just start to feel that dwindling of fulfillment because that's not really sustainable. Whereas like working towards your, um, your career path ideally is sustainable. So it's interesting how money allows you that, that freedom. Um, and it will put you more in touch with, uh, you know, who you really are and where other passions outside of career lie, or maybe things that will eventually become career oriented. Um, but they, they present challenges in their own way, I would say. Yeah. You mentioned there that, uh, you know, you, you talked about fulfillment, like, um, you know, you spend the day on the couch and then you realize that that didn't make me fulfilled. But of course, poker serves as an anchor for fulfillment. If that's, if that's like your thing, um, then you can get your fulfillment out of, I made the right decisions today. I'm a professional poker. All that kind of framework around the poker thing provides you with fulfillment. But if we were to take that away from you, what, or, well, I, let, me, let me phrase that uh, question differently. Uh, do you plan to be Doyle Brunson? Like, do you love the game that much that you're going to be playing like in your 80s and it's going to be like, a, a, not maybe not your soul focus. I don't know if it's Doyle's soul focus, but like a real key part of your life. Or do you have times where you sit down with your notepad um, or you just sit in the garden and just meditate and think to yourself, okay, what is it that I, I want to do with my life? I guess I'm, I'm kind of asking you the question, what is your treasure? If every hero finds the treasure like if uh, indiana jones finds the lost ark or um you know what is what is the treasure that that you're now want to get hmm. wow um well i think that i i could very well still be in poker when i'm Dora brunson's age but i don't know that i'll be as impactful as he's been i think largely that has to do with the fact that he began his uh like he was a trailblazer you know he mm. brought you know, the world series and all that stuff um i, I guess yeah I, I would i would continue to play poker or i will continue to play poker as, as long as i enjoy it and i think a lot of like the ideas of retirement and stuff are kind of muddying the waters of the the point of it it's like if you enjoy it um you know once a year or once a month or whatever, have you really retired? Well, I guess if it's not your main income source anymore, you have. Um, but I find it hard to believe that I would ever go an extended period of time, say a year or multiple years without putting in some semblance of volume because it's just fun. Like mm -hmm. I, every time I, I step away from it, which I will frequently do, I, for me, I find it's important to, especially after the world series is to like take a month off or, just periodically, like, you know, play real hard for a month, take a week or two weeks off and then go at it again really hard. Like I, I find I do better with those bursts of, of volume and bursts of relaxation and non-poker things. Um, as far as things outside of poker, yeah, I definitely do find myself sitting in the garden sometimes writing in my journal and asking myself like, you know, what more is there? And I have some ideas Like I would, I would like to get involved in education in some capacity. And I've certainly tried my hands at a few different projects, which have uh, thus far been wildly unsuccessful. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's just part of the process, like, you know, going from poker elsewhere uh, in business and trying to employ similar principles will sometimes work and sometimes not. Um, but I guess long-term education is something I feel quite passionate about. And I don't really know what my role would be there, but it feels like there's something to it. And, you know, teaching poker for me right now is enough to fulfill that aspect of education, but I don't know if it'll always be that way. I don't know 
that uh, I'll always feel comfortable just, you know, uh, limiting the aspect of teaching that I feel I can offer, or at least ideas I have to poker specifically. And, and what and coupled with that, then what what are your thoughts around purpose? You know that there are some people that believe that they, you know, there's a lot of teachings in self help that every single person is uh, born with a, a special purpose and they need to figure out what it is. Um, I don't necessarily believe with believe in that, but I, I felt the power myself of having a definitive purpose and almost like a like it's like a it's like a lighthouse beam for me. And I know where it is and it keeps me anchored. And every day when I create my plans about what I'm going to do, I make sure that other than I have to do this because I have to, uh, I have to interview Andrew today because I need to make some money. <laughs> it is very different to that's, that's away from my beam of light, but I'm, but I'm very aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, where do you, what are your thoughts on, on purpose? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think, I guess I would, I would push back a bit and say that I think everyone does have a purpose, but maybe the purpose is just as simple as, you know, um, being yourself as, as fully as you're capable of being yourself, whatever that means. Um, so for some people that might be very simple. It's just like, you know, going back to the ordinary is you, know, you grew up in a small town and you, you find a, a simple job and you raise a family. It's just very, it's very simple for others. It might be, you know, um, colonizing Mars, who, who really knows? But um, for me, I guess I feel that to some degree, I've fulfilled a purpose of becoming successful in poker, which was definitely a goal at the point in time that I felt I had developed enough of a skill set that uh, claiming that I would, or I guess setting out um, to uh, make it a, a sustainable career wasn't very delusional. Um, so, you know, I've certainly done that and um, that's fulfilled me for all these years, but yeah, I don't, I don't know at what point in time that may not anymore. And I, I think, you know, that's what we see with, with people like Fedor, for example, who moved on to, uh, you know, try his hand at other businesses and uh, just felt like, you know, poker specifically just wasn't giving him what he wanted anymore. I guess it's, you know, uh, unique to every individual's growth process. Some people still have a lot to gain out of poker, not just financially, but in the term, in terms of the way that it makes you or the way it shape, shapes your perspective, it helps you look at life and maybe deal with the volatility and so on and so forth. So yeah, yeah, I get. I guess. I guess if your purpose in life is to be happy, and poker makes you happy, I mean, because there's there's different ways of thinking about, it, isn't there? There's there's this like almost like tangible aspect to it. So my purpose, like if I think of someone like a Dan Onegranu or Phil Helmuth, you know, it's almost like there are tangible aspects of purpose. So I want to have so many bracelets. I want to be at the top of this chart. I want to be in the poker hall of fame. I want to have a legacy. So there's all those tangible aspects of it. But then is the and, and that's I think where I tend to go to more often is like, what are you after? But there's also like what you alluded to is there's an emotional kind of feeling aspect to it as well. Is I just want to be fucking happy. And I'm really, really happy right now playing poker. And when that changes, I will realize that I my special world has now become my ordinary world. And I now need to think about what my new special world is going to be, which is I imagine what Fedor's done, right? So Special world was poker. He gets into it, gets a high level of success very, very quickly. And then he thinks to himself, this is my ordinary world now. I want a new special world. So now he's going into speaking on stage, on entrepreneurship, building businesses, trying to be, you know, pass on something that he's learned to other people. Um, yeah, I guess uh, one thing that comes to mind is that sometimes, like I mentioned earlier, poker for me is my ordinary world because that's just now so integrated into my life. Yeah. But what makes it special is sometimes taking those breaks from it or just including other things in my life, other hobbies that give me different perspectives. So when I come back to poker, it feels new. It, it feels uh, special and, and extraordinary. So I guess it's, it's not, to me, it's not particularly like binary. Uh, it's, it's much more shades of gray and like, okay, maybe, you know, 
poker is starting to feel dull because I'm just not exercising enough. could be something as simple as that. Or like I mentioned earlier, you know, something for me that's really potent uh, is too much consumption and not enough creativity. And that will start to make me feel dull. So sometimes it's just simple, simple changes in lifestyle that can make an activity that once was special and uh, fulfilling and feels like it no longer is kind of like revamp it and make it more so again. What, what's your thoughts on this then? So you get the fate also of the world who, um, I, I think a better one I, I'm thinking of right now is Stefan Sontheimer, right? So whenever I speak to Stefan, Stefan says, uh, the realism of what's going on right now is if I want to keep playing poker, I want to be amongst the best. If I want to be amongst the best, I've got to put in X, Y, Z amount of work in order for me to be amongst the best. I'm not really willing to do that right now, which means I'm going to be burning my money. So I have a question to make. Like it's like it's like the path to yes again. Can I be the best poker player in the world at the highest stakes playing in those uh, small field MTTs? Yes. But what's the path to yes? Mm-hmm. I have to study uh, 50 hours, 60 hours a week. I'm, I'm not willing to. I'm not willing to do that, right? You know, so you also have that. to travel around the world and play yeah. in all ball fields and put in the volume. And yeah, those are sacrifices that I'm also not willing to make. Right. Yeah. So there's so there's, there's that kind of aspect of it. Um, what what baffles me and I can't wrap my head around is I'm I'm writing a, an article called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Poker Players. You contributed to that, right? And and one of them is uh, I can't remember if it's in the top seven, but it was very very high up. Was taking breaks is really important. But, but thinking back to when I was a kid and, and um, football was my thing. Uh, and today my thing is helping people uh, to recover from alcoholism. Um, I never, ever want to break from it. Like I, I, I never wanted to break for football. I wanted to play football all the time. And if, I'm pretty sure if I interviewed top professional footballers, they would just say, no, I want to play, I want to play, I want to play. And now if I could wake up every day and just help people recover from alcoholism, I would just kind of like keep doing that all the time. Why do so many poker players um, say it's important to get away from the thing that they love? Can you explain that uh, to me and and, and to people that are listening? Well, I can't speak for everyone, but the thing that comes to mind is that, um, say, with, you know, being of service to others, like you're mentioning, uh, once you finish that, say you do that for, you know, however many, four hours in afternoon or something, you can just go on and do something else. With poker at that level, if you're not taking a break, maybe you're in another country or at least what I find is that when I'm in like quote unquote poker mode, um, I just operate differently. Like my, my sleep is a particular way. My diet's a particular way. I find that my thoughts are a particular way. And to me, that's not sustainable to always exist in. I feel like I need, uh, breaks from that to just get a different perspective, almost maybe like a baseline. So for me, that's, that's how I would look at it. Um, mm. So it's almost, it's almost like, it's almost like poker has got a little bit of a dark side. Like, you know, if you're not, you've got to be aware of it and keep, keep it in check a little bit, you know, otherwise it'll bite you on the ass type of thing. Yeah. I think that's fair to say for sure. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of elements of poker that allow you to succeed that, you wouldn't want to apply to other areas of your life. Like if you have a child and you treat it like, you know, you do winning a big hand in a tournament where you're just like devoid of emotion because you know that you might lose a big hand. I don't know. It seems like maybe it's not the healthiest way to deal with a a scenario that's, you know, got a different landscape to it. So. Oh, you you just reminded me there. Like when I, when I used to work on the railway, there, there used to be the saying that went around all the time was, who, who was capable of not taking work home with them? So, yeah. so, the, so the ones that took home, work home with them invariably ended up in relationship spats and more conflict. And the ones that were able to leave um, railway, uh, uh, the railway, uh, they enjoyed more fruitful relationships because of that, that frustration uh, aspect of it, you know. Um, and it sounds like pretty much the same in, in poker. Like you have to be, because of the game dynamics, you have to be a certain way. And that takes a, and it, I think it's Stephen, yeah, Stephen, every time I try to interview Stephen Chidwick when we're away on a live event, he's so apologetic in a really nice way because he's like, Lee, I have to apply so much intense focus on this tour and it drains me so much. 
that I just have to focus on this thing. I'm like a, I'm like a zombie in doing anything else. So like how difficult would that then be to, you know, be a dad or be, uh, be a husband or, 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 or run your nonprofit? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can see now. Yeah. Yeah. Ironically, I think Stevie actually does a really good job of that, at least from what I can tell mm. you know, him as a friend. Um, mm. Yeah, but I, I think there's a lot of truth to that, like who cannot bring their work home with them. Uh, it's tricky, though. And, you know, lots of people uh, at that level are going to, at the, the high roller level, are almost going to be forced to have to learn that skill set. Otherwise, they won't be sustainable, I feel, in that uh, environment. Mm-hmm. And maybe part of the reason that I'm, not competing at that level like I once used to is due to that. It's hard to say, but there's also other sacrifices and uh, the general volatility that I guess it's like, uh, I liked what you said about Stefan's comment, like, can I be the best? Yes, but it requires, you know, this much dedication and all that. And uh, I can't remember if it was on an interview you did or somewhere else, but I recall Jason Kuhn speaking about that. And saying that, like, right now he's willing to put in the work to get to that level and maintain that level, but at some point he might not be. And I think it's important to uh, just be honest with yourself about whether you're willing to put in that work or if you're just going to try to to fake it to get to that place because you want the end result, but you don't want everything else that goes into it. Yeah, it, it reminds me um, in my alcohol, you know, when I'm helping people with alcoholism, there's um, a training module that I created called MUDA, M-U-D-A, which is the Japanese word for waste. So we, we get people to look at the activities that they're, you know, we get them to be really kind of like put their life under a microscope. Very different to how you operate, but it's like, what am I doing every day? Like get the calendar out. What are you doing between one o'clock and two o'clock in the morning, two o'clock and three o'clock in the morning, right? So we get them to look at their life and then we say, Knowing what your purpose is, I want to stop drinking alcohol, which activities are value added, right? So which, which add value towards that goal? And then which ones are not value added at all? Mm-hmm. And, and what ones are value added, but they're wasteful? So a, a, an example uh, would be um, for me, for example, is I'm interviewing you now to earn some money but it's not aligned with my goal. So it's a, it's a, it's a value added waste. Ideally I'd be spending my time helping someone in for two hours to stop drinking alcohol, but I can't do that because I need to earn some money. Right? So when I've been speaking to Jason in the past, Jason's kind of treasure, if you like, and Jason, if you're listening to this, tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, Jason's treasure is longevity. How, how can I live as long as I can as fit and healthy as I can physically and mentally. Uh, and so poker doesn't fit into that. It becomes a value added waste in as much as right now it's kind of like got some real good plus benefits in terms of how it's improving his, his mind. Um, mm-hmm. And also the financial aspect of it is going to set him up to be able to do a lot of things that people have in the quote unquote blue zones networking. So there's a lot of huge positives that he's getting out of poker, but what he's saying, and he's saying it very openly, so it's nothing that I'm saying here, is this is not healthy for me. Like, I cannot compete at these stakes making these decisions on and on and on and on and on. It's not going to happen, you know? Maybe that speaks to the idea of taking breaks, is you're, you're physically drained to a degree where um, you just need to just take some time and rejuvenate, which maybe I guess the professional footballers don't feel, based on your comment earlier. I don't really know that world, so I can't I mean, I'm guessing about the professional footballers in a way, but one thing that comes to mind, I'll ask you, how difficult it is, if breaks are really important, how difficult is it in that high roller scene to take a break when you're on a downswing, when you're not winning? Oh, it's much easier to take a break, I think, when you're on a downswing. It's easier. Ah, okay. Yeah, well, (laughs) oftentimes I've found that when I'm on a big downswing, it's the best time for a break. Because it's just like, okay, you're most likely to make your worst decisions when you're downswinging. You're not often not thinking as clearly. You're often more biased. You're um, often just going to be enjoying the game less. 
So just taking time away, you know, it's, it's never really a bad thing at a time like that, I find. Hmm. I think I asked that question from a very, from a completely different point on the financial kind of uh, continuum that we're all on. Were you so asking I, from like the, how do you accept the loss? And No, just, no. It, yeah. For me, for me, it, it might, like when I, I interview today, I get paid money for it. If I don't mm-hmm. interview, I don't get paid money for it. So that, that mentality that I've had as a kid is I need to work in order for me to make money is very different to poker, right? So I'm still stuck in a framework of I need to get paid every month. So mm-hmm. if I was so that mentality led to me to thinking if I'm playing poker and I'm losing money, I need to keep playing to get that money back, otherwise I'm gonna eventually run out of money. Yeah, but sometimes your your hourly is going to be diminished by the fact that you're not playing your best poker. And even if you might be winning uh, when you're on the downswing, which you know any good professional will still be showing a positive expectation, maybe the amount less to which you're enjoying it isn't worth pushing through. And sometimes, of course, it is, like, say, during the World Series or something. Yeah, yeah, or a um, big Triton stop where you're at Montenegro and... Oh, yeah, you flew out there. And, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Are you getting blinded right now? A little bit, yeah. Do you want to do? <laughs> do you want to do something about that? Um, I can try. I have an adjustable desk. I can try raising it and like standing up. Maybe this will block the sun. I was only going to keep you for a little while longer. If that's right. That actually, seems like a pretty good solution. If you're okay, you're not uncomfortable. No, this is fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we talked. We we touched a little bit there, kind of like the dark side of poker. So you know, like uh, you know, the Star Wars Force, and you know, the, the the dark side and the good side, and all that kind of stuff. Um, what have been every story, every archetypical story has a real big ass villain, right? I mean, there, there are lots of villains, but there's this one big ass villain, right? Now, what has been the one villain that you've had to conquer or you're currently in the process of conquering or you know you need to face at some point this impeding your, impeding, getting in the way of you reaching your treasure? I mean, I personally think that in poker, it's just the internal one. It's, it's the doubt, it's the fear, it's uh, the lack of confidence, lack of self-worth. It's, one of the reasons I like poker so much is I feel like it's a catalyst for self-growth if you, you know, treat it that way. If you just you know, occasionally, casually just mess around with your buddies, it's probably not going to be that way. But for people that are pursuing it as a career, I feel like it so poignantly highlights the aspects of yourself that are out of alignment that you really have no choice but to kind of clean your act up if you want to continue to pursue it in any sort of sustainable fashion so yeah i mean i think i've overcome a lot of that um by virtue of the time i've spent in the game and just the reflections i've had uh you know away from the table but that there's really no limit to the point or no, no limit to the ability to continue to improve upon those things. Like, do I still have doubt? Yeah. But is it less than it was 10 years ago? Also, yeah. So who are, who are, the, who are the allies that have helped you overcome these in, this internal battle with yourself? So let's, let's, call, let's call this villain resistance. Like, let's, coin, let's steal Stephen Pressfield's term from the wall of art, you know, the resistance is that you're rocking up to the poker table and it's like, you're going to fucking lose a day. You're in over your head. You don't know what you're doing. You haven't done enough study, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Who, what are the allies? Who's helping you? Who are the mentors? Uh, it could be books. It could be videos. It, you know, who's helped you to develop a better mindset and to be um, more kind of like uh, compost mentors with these things. Well, I would say again, it's, it's, you know, first and foremost, just going to be my peers that I'm close with. Um, so my, my friends within poker, because we each know that we each deal with those types of, of things. And uh, I guess this in particular isn't something that I would say I've um, explicitly discussed, but uh, I, I would say the, you know, the poker professionals that are in the same demographic are the foremost allies, just because... I don't know. It can, it can just help like seeing someone uh, before a big event who you have a good relationship with 
uh, and just knowing that like they have confidence or they they lack that doubt and sometimes that that's all it takes if you're in that place to begin with to shift you out of it it's just knowing like there's not that much that separates us strategically but mentally maybe right now there is and it's like oh well why is that maybe there's no reason for it maybe it's just a delusion you can just let it go just by having that realization um i also really like uh just like different stand-up comedians because i feel like they're it, it's kind of funny um some of them i feel like are similar to poker players in some ways like they have some internal struggles and you know their way to kind of get away from it or whatever but uh, i guess just the ability to make people laugh is kind of a, a beautiful skill and i would say they're allies as well because sometimes just to get out of like a rut laughing authentically is not a bad way to do it. Mm, yeah, I totally agree there. And, uh, some really good advice. Um, I'm going to leave with a conversation. You said it earlier on. I said, I'd come back to it. You said about extraterrestrials. Yes. Right. Ex- expand a little bit on, uh, extraterrestrials. What, what, what are your views on that kind of thing? And, and why is, uh, why is that kind of in your life at the moment? Well, it's been in my life for a while. Um, I once did see an extraterrestrial that materialized in my my bedroom before I went to sleep one night. And it's like, once you have an experience like that, you really can't just like forget it. I mean, I guess you could if it was like painful in some way and you suppressed the memory, but I don't know, it's just kind of always been something uh, I'm interested in and um, eagerly awaiting a next visit of some sort. Um, I don't know, I just think it's, to me, it's a, a beautiful idea that represents kind of the uh, the utopia that I would like to see the Earth turn into. And like, you know, not only just loving each other as brothers and sisters, but loving off-world creatures or beings as well. And I don't know, just like, to me, uh, yeah, it's just very representative of that uh, potentially beautiful future that... I would, I would even say is, is likely. Okay. On, on a, as we're on a podcast where we're talking about stories and and the hero's journey, now is your opportunity to tell us the story of your encounter with an extraterrestrial. So take it from the top. What, what happened? Just talk us through it. Uh, so on the day in question, I had watched a documentary about ETs, UFOs, et cetera. And, it it just struck a chord in me. I was like, wow, I mean, if this is real, this is this is wild. It was the first time I guess I'd ever seen something like that. Now this type of content is quite pervasive, I suppose. And I was laying outside at night, kind of just uh, looking up at the sky, just wishing, that, like, oh, I just want to see a UFO or see something and uh, no such luck. So, you know, I went inside and was uh, about to doze off to sleep. And as I was laying in my bed, I saw these uh, concentric orange circles, these like uh, opaque rings just cover my entire field of vision. And I could still see like everything else in the room, but they were there overlaid on everything. And then uh, when I would close my eyes, I could still see them. Not really sure how to describe that or what mechanism was at play. And then kind of just the right hand side of of my bed materialized like a gray ET and similarly opaque, just kind of was standing there. And uh, I wasn't really scared per se, but I was definitely shocked. Like I was wanting this to happen, but then it happened. It was like, whoa, this is pretty intense. Um, And yeah, I kind of just laid there and didn't know what to do. I, I guess I kind of froze to some degree. I didn't didn't like feel compelled to stand up and like try to high five it or anything. And eventually I just went to sleep and that was that. Dude, you're a braver man than me. Let me show you something. (laughs) I can't sleep without my face mask (laughs) because ever since I was a kid, I see things in my, I see things in my room. You actually see like 
beings or what do you mean? Yeah, yeah I, I see beings. I, I saw my uncle once when he wasn't here. Um, this is going to make you laugh. In this very room, um, I saw NWA in my in my room after watching the movie about them, right? So, like, but but the, the two main ones that happened for me were repeat incidents. I woke up in the middle of the night, it's like two, three o'clock in the morning, but I was paralyzed, I couldn't move. And I realized there was something at the end of my bed and it kind of run up to my face. And then I was ter- I was terrified. It happened twice in my life. Uh, but I read a book once about sex, called Sex and the Paranormal, and they put it down a hypnagogic hallucinations. They were saying that I was like, I was, I'd woken up, but I was still in a dream state. And when you dream, it, it secretes some sort of hormone that, you know, paralyzes you so you don't harm yourself or fall out of bed or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. So I was kind of hallucinating while I was in it. But what was weird was this hallucination that I had, and I like to think it was a hallucination because I don't want to believe that it was a, a ghost or something. Um, it's been so prevalent throughout the world. Like, did, did have you ever, do you have ever done any research into it, thinking like, was I hallucinating here? Was it a, was it a, a lucid dream or did I really get visited? And why wasn't you shitting yourself? Like, I would have been terrified. Um, I've definitely done research into it. I'm sure it wasn't a lucid dream because I wasn't, I, I didn't go through the process of falling asleep yet. And I have some experience with lucid dreaming. Um, but it's just, it, it's not the same. It's like waking reality. Um, I don't know why I wasn't scared. I mean, I, I was wanting it to happen. So that was part of it. I guess these experiences you're describing have kind of come on uh, a bit more unexpectedly. Oh, yeah, very definitely, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. To me, it kind of sounds like a, a really cool sixth sense that you have. I would, If I were you, I would look into it more. And I, I can relate to the sleep paralysis type stuff. And I had one experience, actually, because it's happened to me a few times, where obviously it's uh, very constricting at first. It's like, whoa, I can't move. But then if you relax into it and just trust that like it's happening for some kind of reason, um, I found that that actually helps a lot. Um, but I don't know. It, it just kind of, I guess, why I wasn't scared goes along with my general life philosophy that like goodness and positivity, benevolence are more pervasive than uh, the inverse. Mm, yeah. So you're more optimistic and I'm more pessimistic. I think you're more growth mindset. I'm more fixed mindset oriented. <laughs> uh, I, I remember interviewing a, a sleep expert for my alcohol addiction podcast, because alcohol. when you stop drinking alcohol, uh, you have a lot of sleep issues. And, and he was a dream specialist. His name is Ruben Nyman. And he, okay. and he, and he said actually that there's a, there's an epidemic throughout the world where people are losing the ability to dream. And, mm. and he's, he's researching why that is. And I told him about the sleep mask and seeing these things in my room. And he said, next time it happens, talk to one of them, right? Yeah, why not? I, I, I tell you why not. I said, are you kidding me? I was lying in bed. At, this is before I had my sleep mask. I opened my eyes and there's this scary ass woman standing by my bed, right? Like, like inches from my face. For me to have the ability in that moment to compose myself, not jump out of my skin and then say, hi, what do you want? Like, I don't know. That's it, it as a stretch for me. Is that fundamentally true, or is that only true because of the beliefs that you have surrounding that experience and the negative experiences you had as a child and so on? I think it's definitely a bias related to Hollywood. Uh, yeah. I, I, it's, it's, linked I think, to, it's linked to cultivation theory. Like, it, like what you see on television happens in reality. You know, yeah. like as a kid who for the first 35 years of his life did nothing but watch TV. Even even now, like living here in LA, I said to Liza, like we we were considering about living here or not, Andrew. I say this place feels like a third world country to me. Like I I I'm I feel as unsafe in America as I do in like South Africa. Like, but but how much is that is driven by cultivation theory and watching too much TV about serial killers and and terrorists and school shootings and, and whatnot? You know, it's like, yeah, I, I don't know, but. One thing I'll say on the topic of, I guess, communicating with these different entities or, or whatever they are, aspects of yourself or, or who knows. Um, my girlfriend's sister has gotten really into lucid dreaming lately, and she's had some really cool experiences where when she's become lucid in the dream, she has full on conversations with like aspects of herself. It's like, right. oh, I'm like, you know, the 
thing which represents your your skin or like your brain or your physicality or this aspect of your psyche. And I guess that's kind of why I embrace these things is um, to me, it's too interesting. I'm too curious to not explore. And if it ends up like um, biting me in the ass, so be it. Like, I, I just have to know. My curiosity <laughs> is too overwhelming. If I, if I was you, I wouldn't be wearing this. Like, I'm wearing this out of sheer terror. I mean, obviously, it's very bright here as well. But <laughs> I think, good, good point. I'm, I'm avoiding it. You know, it's like my lucid dreaming is always when I'm having a nightmare. And then I realize I'm in the nightmare and then I do everything I can to draw the attention of my wife to wake me up. Mm, mm. Um, I, I've, I've never had the capability or the courage to say, no, it's the courage. I've never had the courage to go, oh, you're in a nightmare, stay within, stay in it and interrogate. I've always been, I'm in a nightmare, get out of here quick. So maybe having this conversation will change if I ever have one again in the future. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, I don't, I've had unpleasant dreams and of course no one wants to stay in that experience. I don't think that's what I'm advocating, at least I hope not, but the uh, potential being surrounding your bed at night, that oh, would the, be, yeah. that's what I, I, and, I and, I'd be talking to them for sure. I, I might next time. I'll try it for you, Andrew. And so, so you've heard of the Fermi paradox? What is it? The Fermi paradox about why... Know. Okay, about if there's a gazillion, gazillion planets and stars, all like ours, um, why is there no life? And why can't we have see this life? And, and the Fermi paradox, I don't know it off the top of my head. If Lipari was here, she would uh, know it off the top of her head probably. But it's somewhere along the lines of um, maybe we're reaching the point in our evolutionary existence where we actually destroy ourselves. So... There is no life out there, like because we're just about to destroy ourselves anyway. Or are we so um, ant-like and so kind of inconsequential that the other beings out there they don't they don't even pay attention to us, right? Like so, even if you don't know what the Fermi paradox is, what is your views around why we don't see? I mean, you saw one, but. Why don't I see one? Why isn't the news screaming about it? Why, why are scientists saying, you know, it, it, in general, that it doesn't exist beyond maybe microbes? I mean, what do you think? What's your opinion on that? I mean, the, the few hypotheses that come to mind are, one, maybe they're already here and we just can't identify them. Maybe they're humanoid to some degree, or maybe they are um, small enough that we can't identify them. Um, or maybe they come in such alien forms that we just we don't even really grasp the fact. Like some of our, say, uh, mushrooms or um, aquatic life, like octopi, are incredibly unusual. Maybe they're alien life forms. Um, so I guess in that respect, it seems that it would demand some open-mindedness to like what is what is an alien or what is an ET. The other thing I think is that. Um, if we're going to put ourselves in this, uh, or we're going to describe ourselves as, you know, we're at X level of evolution and, you know, you mentioned maybe we're on the verge of destroying ourselves or whatever. If uh, a being or a race was capable of traveling um, from a different planet, presumably they would be very advanced. Maybe they exist in a higher dimension than us. Maybe we have to learn how to uh, pierce the veil of this dimension into another one. That's kind of how I've sort of come to understood why maybe there was that ethereal opaque component to the, the gray being that I saw. Maybe it's coming from a higher dimension and it's like having to like, uh, I guess, squeeze down into this one. I'm not really sure. Hmm. They're good questions though. But maybe those beings that you see, uh, you know, if they are external to your own mind, maybe they're aliens. Uh, I don't know what I would prefer, whether they were a part of my mind or in real life, but I will think about that. Uh, it's a good, <laughs> good, good place to leave it. Uh, Andrew, uh, goes to show you I have a super duper open mind, which is one of the things that I really love about you. Thank you very much for being a guest here on the, uh, the Run It Once podcast. I've really enjoyed exploring your hero's journey. Yeah, thanks for having me, Lee. It's always a pleasure. <laughs>